Hi everyone, I'm Steve Brunton, and this is the first video lecture on a series I'm calling a Boot Camp on Control, where I'm going to rapidly go through the highlights of optimal and modern control theory. So this is going to include how to uh, write down a system, description of, of a control system with inputs and outputs, uh, in terms of a system of linear differential equations, and then how to design controllers to manipulate the behavior of that system, how to design estimators like the Kalman filter so that if you had limited sensors you could reconstruct various aspects of that system. Um, this is not meant to be an exhaustive, in-depth uh, treatment of the subject, but really kept at a high level. Uh, and my goal is to, first of all, get you familiar with the major um, types of optimal and modern control theory. I want to teach you how to use these in MATLAB to actually work with a real system. And what I also want to give you a feeling for is what in control theory is easy and what's still quite challenging today so that you can get up to speed on the real pressing needs uh, of control theory today. Okay? And again, this is not exhaustive, so you know, if this is really important to you and you want to, you know, you like control theory and you want to go more into depth, there's deeper uh, treatments both on the math side and on the applied design side. Okay? And so I want to give you just a little bit of perspective. Um, I think about the world in terms of dynamical systems, so systems of ordinary differential equations in terms of the state of your system. And this has been an extremely successful viewpoint for modeling real-world phenomenon. Okay, so we model the fluid flow over a wing, or the uh, population dynamics in a city, or the spread of a disease, or the stock market, the climate, uh, planets moving around the solar system. All of these are modeled as dynamical systems. And this has been a very, very successful framework to take in data from the real world and build models that you can use for prediction. But often we want to go beyond just describing the system of interest and we want to actually uh, manipulate the system actively to change its behavior. And so that could be um, just imposing some control law, just, just setting um, inputs into the, that system in a certain pre-planned way to manipulate it. Or you could actually measure that system and make decisions based on how the system is responding to what you're doing. Okay? And so that's kind of the overarching view in control theory is that you have some dynamical system of interest. Maybe it's a, a pendulum or a crane that you want to make more stable. You write down the system of equations and then you design some uh, control policy that changes the behavior of your system to be more desirable. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about. And so I want to begin by just talking about the various types of control uh, that there are. So there's lots of control that goes around all around us every day that is not um, active. It's called passive control. So I'm going to draw just a diagram of the different types of control. So one type that's very common, you see it all the time, is passive control. Okay, so for example, uh, if you see a large 18-wheeler transport truck going down the highway and it has those streamlined uh, tail sections, that's a form of passive control that's passively causing the, the air around the truck to behave in a favorable way to reduce drag. And if you can get away with passive control of your system, that's actually great because you just have to design it up front and then there's no energy expenditure and hopefully you get the desired uh, effect of, for example, minimizing drag on a truck. But passive control is typically not enough and so oftentimes we need to do something like active control. And so active control essentially just means that this is control where we're actually pumping energy into the system to actively manipulate its behavior. Okay? And there's lots and lots of different types of active control. So one that I'm going to tell you about is open loop. This is probably uh, the most common form of active control where essentially you have your system of interest and I'm just going to actually draw this as uh, a block here. So you have some system, and the system has some inputs. I'm going to call them variables u, and it has some outputs that are variables y. Okay? And so what open loop control does is it essentially reverse designs your system and inverts the dynamics to figure out exactly what is the perfect input u to get a desired output y. 
Okay, and so if I take something like uh, an inverted pendulum, so we know that if I uh, if I am very careful, I can stabilize this inverted pendulum. But if in uh, physics, you'll learn that if you just pump this pendulum up and down at a high enough frequency, it will naturally stabilize the dynamics. Okay, so if my base just oscillates at a, at a high frequency sine wave, then the dynamics of this pendulum, so, so the base is U, maybe Y is the angle of this pendulum, and my desired control is to make this pendulum essentially stay at vertical. Okay, And so if I pump in energy in a pre-planned way, I just make my hand go up and down in a sinusoid, I can put in a sinusoid here and I can get the desired uh, Y that I want. Okay, And essentially that is open loop control. It's very commonly used. Essentially you think about your system, you pre-plan a trajectory, and you just enact that control law. Okay. But the downside of open loop control is that you're always putting in energy to this, um, to this U. So in the inverted pendulum example, I constantly have to be pumping this thing up and down sinusoidally. And the minute I stop, the stability, uh, it becomes unstable and it falls. Okay? And so the idea is that what we can do is called closed loop feed feedback uh, control. So closed loop feedback control. And essentially what this means is that we take sensors, I think my pen is drying out, we take sensors, sensor measurements of what the system's actually doing, and then somehow we build a controller, I'm just going to call this a controller, and we feed that back into our, our input signal that can manipulate the system. So for example, in that inverted pendulum example, as a human, if I had a tall enough pendulum so it was slow enough, I could actually measure with my eyes if it's starting to wobble, and I could do much more subtle control. So if you have ever played around with a, as a kid with a broomstick kind of trying to stabilize it, you know that you can actually get pretty good at it so that with very low energy input, but very small hand motions, you can stabilize this thing so that it doesn't fall. Okay, And so that's the basic idea, is that by measuring the output, you can often do much, much better than just feeding in kind of a pre-planned control law. Okay? So sensor-based feedback, measuring the output, and then feeding that back as the input is basically going to be the entire subject of what we're going to talk about in this control boot camp. So closed loop feedback control is the name of the game. Uh, and that's, that's most of what we're going to talk about. Now that's not to say that if you can design a good open loop or a good passive control, there, you know, there are some times you would do that. But in the systems we're going to be interested in, closed loop feedback based on sensors is going to give dramatically better performance. Okay? And so I want to talk a little bit about why you would have feedback. So I just want to make a, a quick list of why feedback. Because this is a very, very important, um, important topic in control theory. So I want to motivate, again, just maybe in more uh, concrete terms, why would I actually measure the system and feed it back instead of just ignoring any measurements and using open loop? So why feedback over open loop control? OK, so this is a question I always ask my class. And I let them think for a little bit. Why would you actually want to have the sensors um, feeding back into your system. Okay, so one answer that I get um, most often is maybe my system has some inherent uncertainty. Okay, so if my system is uncertain, so uncertainty is one of the main en enemies of open loop control, right? So if I have this pendulum and I've perfectly pre planned what I want to do, Let's say that the pendulum is one centimeter taller, or it's a little bit heavier, or there's wind blowing, or something like that. Then any kind of uncertainty in that system is going to make it so that my pre-planned trajectory is going to be suboptimal. But if I measure the output and I realize that it's not doing what I want it to do, I can adjust my control law even if I don't have a perfect model of my system. Okay, so uncertainty is a big one. Another really important one is instability. So with open loop control, 
I can never fundamentally change the behavior of the system itself. So in the pendulum example, I could pump in an amount of energy with the sinusoidal base motion that would force the system to kind of correct itself up to vertical, but I'm not actually changing the system's dynamics itself. The system still is unstable and has an unstable eigenvalue. But when I have feedback control, I can directly manipulate the actual dynamics of this closed loop system and I can change the, the dynamic properties. I can change the eigenvalues of this closed loop system. Okay, And I'm going to show you that as the last example in this overview. So the third thing that I think is really, really neat is that with feedback control, you can also reject disturbances in your system. So let's say that I have some external disturbance D that's coming into my system. And this happens all of the time. So, so for example, let's say in my pendulum example, uh, there's a gust of wind. So that's a disturbance that would be very hard for me to predict or model or measure. Um, so there's this gust of wind that comes. And if I had an open loop strategy, essentially that might not be able to correct for that gust of wind. Whereas that gust of wind will pass through the system dynamics, will be measurable through some uh, sensor, and if my feedback control is good enough, I can actually correct for that disturbance. So I think of uncertainty as internal system un uncertainty, kind of disturbances to my model. And I think of disturbances as external or exogenous forcing of the system that may be too difficult or too costly or too complicated to, to model or predict or measure. Okay? And feedback essentially handles all of those basic issues. It can handle disturbances, it can handle uncertainty, and it can fundamentally change the stability of your system to make it more or less stable by actually changing the eigenvalues of this closed loop system. And unfortunately, open loop can't do any of those things, um, which is a huge drawback. And I guess the fourth one is uh, energy or efficiency. So I'll just say efficient control. So again, in the case of the pendulum, in the open loop case, I constantly had to pump this thing up and down. So I was always putting energy in. But in the case of sensor-based or elegant feedback control, you can picture yourself trying to stabilize this broomstick. If you're doing a really good job, if you have a really good controller, the thing is barely moving at all. And so you almost have to put no energy in to correct it. So effective sensor-based feedback control is also much more efficient which is really, really important in lots of applications. So if you're going to send um, a rocket somewhere, you better have an efficient controller because you don't want to be wasting fuel. Okay. So the last thing I want to show you is just this idea of why you can change the fundamental system dy dynamics um, and change the stability with feedback control. Okay. So the basic uh, property that we're going to, or the basic mathematical architecture we're going to be working with in this class is going to be a state space system of ordinary differential equations. So we're going to have a state variable x. x is a vector that describes all of the, th the quantities of interest in my system. So for example, in my pendulum, it could be the angle and angular velocity. It could be two states. Um, if I have you know, an airplane going through the sky, it could be the three, uh, the position vector x, y, and z, and also its um, its rotation angles and their derivatives. Okay, so it could be like a six degree of freedom or twelve state, um, twelve component vector x. And so what we're going to look at is the system x dot equals ax. So we're going to start with linear systems of equations that describe how those states interact with each other. Okay, and so I'm going to assume that we're all pretty comfortable with this. Um, linear systems of ODEs. So for example, we know that the solution of this is x of t equals e to the matrix A t times x at time, time 0. Okay, so we know how the system behaves. We know that if, if A has any uh, eigenvalues with a positive real part, then the system will be unstable. And if all of the eigenvalues have negative real part, then these have stable dynamics that, that go to 0 as time goes to infinity. But what we're going to do in control theory is we're going to add plus bu. 
So we're going to add this ability to actuate or manipulate our system. Okay, so we're going to say that U is our actuator. It's the thing we can, it's our control knob. Okay, so it could be, um, in the case of the pendulum, it could be the position of the base or it could be the voltage onto a motor that controls something. But this is the knob that we get to turn to try to stabilize our system. And B tells you how this control knob directly affects the time rate of change of my state. Okay? Um, and down the road, we're going to look at another extension where we're actually going to measure only certain aspects of the state. So we're going to measure some linear combination of the state x. And this might actually be a limited set of measurements. We might not measure all of this, this state if it's high dimensional. And we might only have access to those few sensor measurements in y. But for now, let's just talk about the top equation. So if I assume that I can measure everything in the system, and in this case of the pendulum, as a, as a human, I have a pretty good estimate of its vertical position and how fast it's moving. So let's say I can measure all of x. Then we can develop a control law. Let's say u equals minus some matrix k times x. Okay, so I'm just going to say, let's posit a basic control law that my control input u is going to be some matrix times x, just some constant constants times the components of x. When I plug this in, so this is, this is really sensor-based feedback where y equals x. Okay, in this case, we're assuming that y equals x. We can measure all of our state. And we're going to feed that back into a control law, which is minus k. u equals minus k times x. And we're going to try to modify the dynamics. So if you plug u equals minus kx into our dynamics, we basically get, and let's make another color here, we basically get x dot equals ax and then minus bkx. Okay, so b is maybe a tall vector, the same, or a set of vectors, the same height as x. k um, is kind of the transpose size of that. And so this is a matrix of size n by n if x is an n-dimensional state. And so this equals a minus bk times x. So notice that by, by measuring the state, in this case we're measuring the full state x, and feeding that back to the control u through this law, u equals minus kx, we're able to actually change the dynamic matrix. So now we have a new dynamical system, x dot equals a minus bk times x. And so it's actually the eigenvalues and of this matrix that tell you if the system is stable. So I could have a really originally unstable system like this inverted pendulum. And by measuring the state and feeding it back to my control knob that I get to move, I can stabilize the dynamics. I can actually make the system asymptotically stable. Okay, And so figuring out when you can do this, so this doesn't work for all systems and for all measurements and for all actuators. So figuring out when the system is controllable and how to design this K so that it is well controlled are going to be the subjects of the next couple of lectures. Okay, But really, really important, feedback solves all of these fundamental problems. If I have an uncertainty in my system, I can compensate for it by measuring what's actually happening and feeding that back. If I have an instability in my system, I can actually change the dynamics with this feedback. And you can't really do that with open loop. I can also account for external disturbances like a gust of wind that might have been really hard to measure and could totally throw off your pre-planned trajectory. But if you measure what's happening, you can account for and correct for that. And finally, feedback control is efficient. If you're doing effective feedback control to stabilize a system, then the more effective you are, the less energy you have to put in. Okay, so this should be a really exciting set of lectures. I'm really hoping to get you up to speed quickly uh, and with MATLAB examples so that you can control these systems. You can design controllers to actually uh, manipulate your system to do what you want it to do. Okay, thank you.